Hello, I'm Robin Ince, and I've just been pretending to read this book. I have no idea what's in it. We're doing a new series called Bibliomaniac, and it's inspired by the book that I wrote last year, all about the wonders of those who sell books, those who read books, and the things that we find within books as well. Sometimes ideas, sometimes bus tickets. This is episode one, and this is about a day that we spent in Exeter at two of the public libraries there, and then eventually at the Oxfam Bookshop. So I hope you enjoy it because we found some incredible things. We went underground into the stacks of the library and the treasures that were there, it was, well, I, I could have stolen, a, I didn't steal anything, but I could have stolen a lot. In fact, we may well make a kind of Ocean's 15 film, which is all about a group of bibliomaniacs like me uh, breaking into Exeter Central Library. And in fact, I've given away that we are gonna do that. I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, the main thing is, we're gonna have a whole series of these and if you can support us as well, so we can just keep making film after film, that would be fantastic. If you can support us, just go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. I hope you enjoy this episode one of Bibliomaniac. I'm gonna to return to pretend to read this book now. I'm trying to go to as many libraries as well as independent bookshops at the moment and this is the week of World Book Day so my Monday I've managed to over the next six hours I'm going to do three talks two at Exeter Libraries and then finally at the Oxfam Books and Music I'm going to try as much as possible to make them as different as possible and I'm also going to visit the archive and storeroom of the library so this is my book day in Exeter. This is Jez, who is a librarian and author, and uh, you're going to take me to the cage, which is in there, which is where all the special things are. Oh, that's right. Let's go. Because you found, I mean, it was amazing, the stuff that you showed me yesterday. Yeah. And the fact that this is, so this is the largest library in Devon. Yeah. And I was just finding out it's about five times as many books down here as there are upstairs in the library or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and a lot, of these come, a lot of these come from the days when the library was part of um, the museum, a couple of, couple of doors down, basically, the Royal Albert Memorial Museum. So the, these are, are sort of collections which may have been donated from there. So a lot, a lot of the interest is... is uh, obviously with the books, but also where they came from, um, who donated them. First of all, it's, I absolutely adore coming to libraries because there is such beauty in knowing that, you know, somewhere like Exeter, where so many places around, you know, the UK, people have been battling for their libraries all the time. And I think the existence of libraries is something that makes us better humans. Uh, I, I have arguments, I, I, I wrote a piece a while ago for the New Statesman a long, long time ago uh, about the nature of, of libraries and I got all these people going, oh, but libraries are just middle class, aren't they? And I thought, well, this is such a typical thing for a middle class readers of a middle class publication to say, which is to damn something that I've, I've, I've travelled around the UK a great deal and, and, and really across the world and I always go to libraries and what I love about libraries is just they are so vibrant. There are talks in libraries, there is a place for you know, all the books you can find and that you can want. A lot of people who use libraries, of course, don't get the excitement of going, like for, for a lot of my friends, uh, who I, I was lucky, I grew up quite privileged, uh, for a lot of my friends from working class backgrounds, this was where they got their first books. This was where it started. People who've ended up being great authors and very eloquent human beings, the excitement of coming here and going, I can only take out four. Do you remember? I think you're allowed to take out more now, but you, it just used to be four. And you're like, going, which four? You know, I can't take out the making of Doctor Who again, but I need it so much. You know? And, and that, that excitement is something which has continued throughout their whole lives. And then seeing the fact that for older people sometimes that may not have access to certain publications and books and whatever, this is a place where they can come and there is also a sense of community. What I think independent bookshops and libraries both share a thing, which is they feel like a safe space to be in. They feel like a place where you are free to browse, free to look, and that actually, you know that lovely thing where sometimes you don't know the person, but they're looking at a book that you really love and you can't hold it back and you go, you've really got to take that one out. It's so brilliant, right? It's one of the things that I was, I was doing the uh, Slapstick Festival last weekend, a weekend before last in Bristol. And at the Bristol Old Vic, there's a little library corner, just, just one bookshelf, a beautiful selection of books. 
And there was a woman just looking uh, near one of my favourite books of all time, which is uh, called Stay With Me by Ayabami Adebayo. It's incredibly moving. Uh, just just a, a book that, uh, you're, you know when you're entirely immersed in a book? You know that thing sometimes when you're reading and you are so in that character of the person that's going through that story that if they're in a point of jeopardy, you can't stop reading? because you feel that when you've closed the book, they're still in that jeopardy. But if you can read a few more pages, maybe they'll be on safe ground, <laughs> right? It's that kind of book. And it's one of those books that every time you go, oh, I know what this book's about, you then get to chapter four and go, no, I don't, right? It's a beautiful spell of a book. And that was really near her. And I thought, I, I don't know this person, but I'm just gonna walk up there because I'm doing some events here and, and it feels like a space where it's not threatening or anything like that. And I went up and said, I'm so sorry to interrupt. She said, I know you're looking at these books. You must get that book. And then she went, oh, I'm glad you came over. I saw your talk last year. <laughs> I was thinking if he comes over, I'll know which books to take. And I love <laughs> things like that, right? These are interesting. They look, they look sort of nothing much, really. The, these little books here, they were um, from um, the Dun Ema Press and the Koala Press, a sort of Irish press set up by the, the sisters of W.B. Yeats. Oh, wow. Um, and they were all, these, these were all from, the, from, as you can see, from the collection of William Cadbury, um, who was the, um, from the Cadbury, yeah. the Chocolate Cadbury family, uh, and was very passionate about Irish culture. So he, he set up a, um, uh, a, a very sort of um, strong relationship with, with Elizabeth Yeats, um, who was one of the ones who... who um, who uh, ran the press. And so, um, going from the early 20th century, um, she started sort of signing the books for him as he collected them. But by the end, it's, it's obvious that they, they become quite close. So here, here it's to William A. Cadbury and Emmeline Cadbury, um, William's wife, with appreciation and gratitude from Elizabeth Yates, um, 1933 Dublin. But um, this, this, is, this is the amazing one. Let's, let's see if I can find the particular one. Yeah, I think it's this one, W.B. Yates. Um, obviously one of the most famous poets of, of the uh, late 19th and 20th century. So this is a book of his. Signed. Um, signed by W.B. And that, that as well, just the, yeah. the printing there is it's, 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 a, it's a small press, so it's all sort of hand printed um, with these little... Each one has got... Or they, they have lots of different little sort of symbols uh, in, the, uh, in the front pages. Yeah, so it's just, it's just a, it's an amazing collection. As you, there's quite a few of them. Um, I'll give you that because you know exactly where that one goes. Well, well did. <laughs> <laughs> just nearby, we've got other other um, sort of books produced on on um, hand presses, and some of the Kelms got press books. These are beautiful. Um, again, um, last last decade of the nineteenth wow. century, um, William Morris set up um, his hand press um, on the banks of the Thames. His Kelms got house on the banks of the Thames. Um, and produced these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful books. Um, this is his anarchist utopia, News from Nowhere. Um, and as you can see, it just has these, these gorgeous... That is fantastic. Yeah. ...gorgeous prints. And that's his house in, in Kelmscott in Oxfordshire. And it has, the, it has a very short chapter in here where it's basically a guide to this new utopia, a very green utopia. And there's a bit where they, they go past the Houses of Parliament and, and the guests ask what, is, what it's used for. And they say, well, we use it as a store for our dung. This is lovely because it's very, it reminds me also, you can see that this was an in, inspiration for someone like Alistair Gray yeah. in, in, in the style of his books and the design of his yeah. books. That's one of the ones I, I, I bought up um, yesterday uh, for, for your talk yesterday. Origin and meaning of apple cults. I'm so glad that that is there. You know, that this, this is all preserved. This is so important, everything that we have here. Joe Lindsay, told, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, people that are hanging rock both the book and the film. And uh, Joan Lindsay, very interesting person. And have any of you read Pick and Hanging Rock? Don't be handled, Jeff. Uh, any of you, you read that? You really should. It's such a great. And now you can. Her editor, Joan Lindsay's editor, decided to remove the final chapter because she felt it revealed too much. If you don't know the story, it's basically about a group of uh, girls. It's Edwardian, probably, isn't it? About 1905, something like that. Um, and they go on this picnic, which is their school. And uh, initially, I think it's four of the girls disappear on the mountain uh, on Hanging Rock, and no one knows what's happened to them. It's about how it, it, but it's incredible. And, and the film by like Peter Weir is, is utterly remarkable as well. But yeah, Joan Lindsay, uh, Time Without Clocks. I bought a copy of this quite recently, and I, uh, I, I shouldn't have done I was out touring Australia, I'd already bought a second suitcase, 
Um, and then someone offered me another bag, so I was like, why did you do that? And I was going around, in fact, I, I think there's only two Oxfam's in Australia, and one of them is in Adelaide, and I was going to that Oxfam, and I pulled out Joan Lindsay's timed out clocks, and I thought, well, I won't buy it this time, it's going to be too many. And then I opened the book, and there was a four-leaf clover inside it. So then I had to buy it, because then that meant that book was a palimpsest. Again, because this was not just one story. This was the story of Joan Lindsay, this was her autobiography, but also it was the story of someone who'd been reading that and then been a little bit distracted maybe, and then they were just sat on a lawn or they were sat you know, somewhere out in a meadow and they just thought, while I'm here, I'll just look through the clovers to find a lucky one, and that person eventually found a four-leaf clover and they placed it in that book. So I love the fact that that book holds someone else's story. What an amazing book that is. That's fascinating. Original records of early non-conformity under persecution and indulgence. So I'll just flick through these. So there's so much. And Julian Coney pops up in the book. The um, I, oh, so Henry at Rollins men, Viv Stanshaw, absolutely wonderful there. If I had all the money that I'd spend on drink, I'd spend it on drink again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We've got eight, 18 volumes of Nietzsche. Um, some would say too much Nietzsche. I don't know. We've got a similar. Ecky Homo is one of my. I, I love this one. There, there we go. Another beautiful book plate of Exeter City Library, and because uh, this has got those wonderful chapter titles, hasn't it? This is. Uh, let's see. This is why I am so wise. Why I am so clever. Why I write such excellent books. Why I am a fatality. That's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that is so great. Um, it's like my son has an English teacher that he really likes his English teacher. He thinks she's great. And I know that when he comes out from her classes, he's so excited to read. He's so excited to find out about new authors. And the same with science. You know, when I see... And, and that, that science, I think, is a real battle because all of those little tick boxes... But what, what you really want to know is not the equation. The first thing you want to know is, why did that human being come up with that equation because scientists don't sit down and go right I think today is the day to do an equation yeah what happens is maybe they're on a tram and they're daydreaming as they look out the window maybe they've had they've been sleeping and they've had some kind of dream that night which has somehow created an image in their head which they feel might be connected to the nature of the universe once we start to know that it's like I mean I think it's one of those big problems where we have on the science side of things which is people think science is done by scientists who are a special group of people who are born with the scientist gene. But scientists, of course, are human beings and the greatest scientists and some of the most interesting scientists and some of those interesting minds I know, the first thing that I love about them is the incredible, like we, we do a show, I don't know if you heard, did anyone hear the Infinite Monk Cage? We did, we've done two about flies. And they are, the, the Erica McAllister who came on about flies, she has a deep knowledge of flies, but a tremendous excitement about telling about flies. She has both the things that you need. And her excitement is, and some of the really grotesque images of flies as well. We put a lot of people off their fish finger sandwiches with some of the unpleasant things that happened with flies. But that, and then we, the episode that just went out was about spiders. And we had, amongst others, we had this wonderful woman who's a, 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 a spider specialist. I knew it was going to be fun. I knew it was going to be fun. We, we, we recorded this in Sydney. Two reasons it was going to be fun. I found out that Brian Cox is scared of spiders. Excellent! <laughs> we had three guest spiders. We had a St Andrew's cross spider, an orb weaving spider, and a huntsman spider, right? Uh, the Huntsman Spider, I don't know if you heard the show, if you didn't, I'll tell you the story. The Huntsman Spider, of all Australian spiders, kills more people than any other. It's still a very low number, by the way. It's not, not many pigs. So that, that kind of terror, we often, oh my God, I've come to Australia, it's just filled with snakes and spiders. He's fine. The Harbour Bridge has got almost none on them at all, right? Um, the thing is that uh, the Huntsman, it's not because it's particularly poisonous. It has an unfortunate element of surprise. Huntsman spiders fall asleep on warm car engines. And then when you start your car the next morning, it wakes them up. And while you're driving, they crawl out and go, I, uh, ah! and you crash your car. So that's why <laughs> nothing that they've evolved to do, right? And I knew it would be fun as well, because when, uh, first of all, like, like Brian, when the St. Andrew's cross spider, which was an amazing, such a beautiful thing. There was the female spider in the middle of its web. And, uh, and then our spider specialist, she introduced a little male spider and 500 people in a bar in Sydney went, at last, sex followed by cannibalism, which didn't happen, unfortunately. She wasn't interested in either of those things. And um, Buffon's natural history. I mean, the natural history, again, all of these natural history books, which are, you know, Pre the theory of evolution, yeah. pre you know, and, 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 and sketches of a bit like when you go to a museum and there's bad taxidermy because they've sent the skin, but no one's actually known the shape of the creature. Yeah. So they just fill it with sand, yeah. and then you go, oh, well, that's not really what it looked like. But but I, I love you know all of this where a lot of it will be kind of 
you know, a mixture of guesswork yeah. and and uh, kind of third party evidence. Oh, look, curious discourses. Curious discourses, <laughs> yeah. What's two this volumes. One? But um, there's no structure, you know that. The structure is basically love and excitement and joy. British uh, Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, let's see if we get, let's get 1859, because obviously that's the year of uh, Charles Darwin. Uh, um, experiments to determine the efficiency of continuous and self-acting brakes for railway trains, report of Dublin Bay Dredging Committee, report on the observation of luminous meteors, report on a series of skulls of various tribes of mankind inhabiting the pool, the Committee on Steamship Performance, so that's so far, light heat magnetism, astronomy, meteorology, chemistry, descriptions of genera of fish of Java. It's fascinating, this. I can't find structure of shell, varieties of species of new pheasants. Very important, the new pheasant species, as we know. Will they be more delicious than the last? Notes of a skull of a wombat from the bone caves of Australia. Notice of the skull of a seal from the Gulf of California. On drift, on drift pebbles found in the stomach of a cow. Uh, on the employment of the electric eel as a medical shock machine. That's a pretty good, that's a good year, even if there was nothing much there about the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. <laughs> ah, here we are, with particular reference to Mr. Darwin's work on the origin of species by natural selection. So there we find it in 1861. There we go, Professor Daubin's remarks on the final causes of the sexuality of plants, with particular reference to Mr. Darwin's work on the origin of species by natural selection. My favourite library book that I found was, I forget her name now, a, a New Zealand artist that I'd seen an exhibition of. And uh, it was originally from Chelmsford Library, and I'd never seen this. I don't know if librarians have ever seen old, you might have seen them. Uh, it had a note on it. First of all, right, it had the list of how much money you'd owe, depending on the number of days of lateness, right? Um, then it had a note about if you damaged the book. And then it had, if this has been near anyone who is diseased, take it immediately to Coval Furnace. <laughs> That's an amazing, I've never said, so the social history of that, of library books, you might damage the book, it might be late, or it might be covered in disease. History of chess here, by the way, Alice, just in case you're wondering. I no, think it's that Charles history. Lamb? Char oh, I saw it. This is probably one of my favorites. It's definitely in the top two favorite um, Oxfam bookshops. This is in Exeter and I've always found, last time I was here, in the glass cabinet, I'm relieved there's nothing in the glass cabinet this time, uh, there was uh, a book about UFOs that I bought for about 60 quid. And that's one of the reasons that Vox fans are quite happy to have me doing events, because they always know that they'll make money off me, even if no one buys one of my books. Like in this shop, I, in fact I've done it already, right, I found one of the books that I, I couldn't resist, and they've got two copies of it, is Ether and Reality by Sir Oliver Lodge, right? Now, I know Ether's out of fashion now. Yeah, Ether's wrong. Shut up, Brian. Anyway, the, uh, and uh, this is, but I love it. What a beautiful book there. So it's just got all the different things, the ether and its vibrations, uh, the ether as a transmitter of force, electricity and its action across space, all of these things. And there's two copies of that. So one of you can buy one of these copies, but I've already chosen which one I'm going to get. This one. I'm going to get this one because this also has something in it. It just has a little card which says, with author's compliments. So immediately, there's some, don't look like you're going to have that one. You're not. The, um, so there's something about a little thing left behind. So Oliver Lodge, there we go. This was sent with his compliments, making it even more ethereal. And, um, and that's, I love finding, you know, I love finding little notes in books. Marginalia, I adore. Uh, my favorite piece of marginalia is in a book called Mechanics of the Mind by Sir Colin Blakemore. And uh, it was, he did the uh, wreath lectures when he was quite young. I think he was the youngest person to do the wreath lectures at that time. And in fact, died last year, interesting man. And, um, and it was filled with this inky scrawl, uh, very much like kind of you know, academics, like, it was like the kind of, you would imagine the scrawl of somewhere in an M.R. James short story. Somebody, and it was just filled with anger. This person was furious about how wrong this book was in his mind. And he wanted you to know, this man seems to know nothing about the hippocampus. I would not say this about the frontal lobe. He doesn't even seem to understand buttered toast. And then you look at the page and you go, but there's nothing about butter or toast on the page. What's he talking about? And then on page 53, he says, I'm going to stop reading now. And then on page 56, you found out that that didn't happen. He kept on going. 
So I love that that is left behind. I love finding a bus ticket in a book or a train ticket in a book and thinking, was that the last time this person, this book was opened? Was it on that particular journey to Ealing Broadway? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, oh look, oh my God, it's, it, it's signed. There's By the Reverend, Reverend Mr. Lamb, the history of chess, together with short and plain instructions by which anyone may easily play at it without the help of a teacher. By the Reverend Mr. Lamb, written in his own uh, pen, now faded to brown. Amazing. 1765. Uh, printed um, for J. Wilkie in St. Paul's Churchyard and G. Fryer at the Bible in Bell Yard, Temple Bar. It is that thing that you know we were talking about yesterday when I was doing the talks here and and, and in Oxfam that that tangibility yeah. to hold that book and to have a sense of that human being because yeah. that's not you only have, you don't have to hold many hands to have how many generations it takes back to there. Yeah. So when you see that ink mm. and when you see that aspiration, you know th this is I think all of these things are such a kind of direct connection to so many humans, yeah. so many changing ideas. Mm. John Heats, my friend John Heats, who's written many wonderful books, uh, one of his recent books was uh, William Blake versus the World, which is a fantastic book, not merely about William Blake, but also about the nature of human imagination. It's very interesting. John was always interesting on so many different levels. And um, we did an event at the British Library just to be filmed, because it was not long after lockdown, so the British Library wasn't open. John, myself, and the poets Kay Tempest and Selina Golden basically had the British Library pretty much to ourselves. It was just us and a couple of curators. And at one point the curator said, come over here and took out William Blake's notebook. And so there it was, we were allowed to, I actually didn't handle it because as you saw, see when I picked up Smile Please by Jean Reese, I was far too worried because I, I just looked at it as Kay and Selena held it. And yet there was Rose that was sick and the little doodles that he'd done there, the way he painted it. And the fact that it survived, because of course, as you know, he didn't die famous, placed in a book was great. The fact that someone thought, we've got to put this somewhere, we've got to keep this. And both Selena and Kay just, just cried. And I kept saying, put the text further away from your eyes. You're going to drip on William Blake's book. And they're all salty tears, they'll ruin the rose. Paper is so beautiful. The yeah. Royal Albert Memorial thing. Ah, oh, you Fisher see that? There Library. we go. That, yeah. That's that's the, that's the origins. You see the Albert Memorial yeah. Museum. Um, that's oh, where you the say, yeah. That's where the library started out. So you've got a. You've and then the instruction from William Morris: If this book be bound, the edges of the leaves should only be trimmed, not cut. In no case should the book be pressed, as that would destroy the impression of the type and thus injure the appearance of the printing. The care. And then I think of when we did the Infinite Monkey Cage book, and when we were signing the first lot of them, we just went, is this amount of ink meant to come off? And that, you know, the ink hadn't even set on the page. Yeah. And here you see a love of books and a care yeah. of the fact that they aren't, this is not merely, you know, well, this is far from a commercial enterprise. This is a necessity yeah, yeah. to create these. Absolutely. Wild flowers worth notice. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? Many wildflowers, nip, nip. Oh, so this one, because you might have been noticing wild flowers that weren't worth noticing. And now, thanks to this book, you can save so much time in every lay-by you visit, right? And, and this is a beautiful gold down the side as well. And uh, in fact, Trent, I got a book for, for, for Trent's wife uh, the other day. Uh, Derek Jarman, who's a, I, was a I still am a huge fan of Derek Jarman. Derek Jarman was one of those people who, again, uh, for those of you, you, you remember that time when you were finding out who you were and maybe some of you here, if you are my normal audience, are people who when you found out who you were, found out you might not fit in in every single corner <laughs> of the world. That uh, in fact you were seen as being idiosyncratic, eccentric or strange possibly with your interests, right? And, uh, and Derek Jarman was one of those people I remember reading as a teenager, first of all seeing his films on Channel 4, what a world that was for me. I couldn't believe Channel 4. It had experimental art films, repeats of The Prisoner and a <laughs> Boris Karloff season. That was everything that this child needed, right? So yeah, I loved reading Derek Jarman's voice. I loved, you know, this was also the time of uh, a, a huge amount of, of, of you know, a, a new birth of a new kind of homophobia which came out of HIV and, and you know, and Derek Jarman was this voice that as a 16, 17 year old I would listen to and I'd go, this is a mate, he's an actor.
activist, but he's never also, like James Baldwin, the beauty is always there. So it doesn't just become a voice of anger. It is a voice also driven by the fact that we can be better people. And the book that I got for, for Trent's wife, which, which Derek Jarman loved, an old 1909 two volume book about flowers. And it's just called Beautiful Flowers and How to Grow Them. Isn't that a lovely title? Again, just, I, I absolutely adored that. Um, what was that, Dave Allen, Ivor Cutler, something. Right, now. I know it's your job and everything, but I also know your love for the, but the excitement. Yeah. Every now and again, she's go, I need to come down here to find something. When I first saw and those. And then go, oh, well, this can take more than five minutes because. Yeah, so when you, yeah, yeah exactly. That. I mean, William Morris is a bit of a hero of mine. So when I found these, it's like. <laughs> yeah. He, he may well have actually made that with his own hands because, there weren't many people working at the Camel Scott Press. He learned how to, to work the press. He had a couple of people helping him. He probably he probably handled that at some point. If he if he didn't actually do some of the, the sort of laborious um, hand printing himself, certainly William Morris was very particular about the materials used for for, for his books. I mean, he he sourced oh, geez, he sourced the amazing. finest the finest linen papers and and um, the finest inks. You know, he went to he went to extreme trouble to 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 make sure it was of the finest quality. Here beginneth the defence of Guinevere, but knowing now that they would have her speak, she threw her wet hair backward from her brow, her hand close to her mouth, touching her cheek, as though she had had there a shameful blow, and feeling it shameful to feel aught but shame, all through her heart, yet felt her cheek burn so she must a little touch it, like one lame, she walked away from Garwain with her head Doctors. I'm not going to turn it. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't know what this is, right? This is called Symbol of Man on Body Soul for Stage and Studio, right? And uh, there's just lots of pit there. That's a man being a fellow. I, I don't know what that is. It's, it's, it's a man in a tiny little pouch, and it's uh, that's him as Romeo or Hamlet. I don't know what's going on. Oh, British public characters of 7, 9, 1798. Hang on a minute. Yeah. And the comedian. Right, oh my goodness. The character of an actor in private life has been usually, usually beheld throughout all Europe with a certain degree of coolness bordering on contempt. So there we are. This nothing's changed. <laughs> the object of this memoir known to all lovers of the drama by the familiar name of Tom King seems to have received a better education than the bulk of the fraternity. Oh, so he's all right. He's not so bad, that one. <laughs> Tom King. So I, but I always, I never felt I fitted in. I've always felt like a weirdo in almost every environment that I've gone into. I've always felt that people are going, the bloody talk, I mean, uh, uh, now I control it. Now, before I would walk through the world and you might be going, what's he talking about? Who's that weirdo? Now, I know you're thinking that, but we've created this kind of, you know, idea that it's art. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I always, and it's only very recently, it really is only since the, the, uh, the diagnosis from an autistic stranger of ADHD, where everything made sense. And I will quickly say to all of you here, there's a lot of talk about ADHD now, and it might seem like it's gone a little bit crap. I think the truth of ADHD, that I think there'll be a lot of negative things talked about this. But the first thing is, it's really changed my life in a big way because I have such chaos. What you're seeing now is very much a representation of how my brain works all the time, right? A mother came up to me and she went, I've just been talking to my 14 year old and she said, that's what my head sounds like. <laughs> so I like these things, that, you know, this again, this is, this is where books and ideas, this bit of opening ourselves up. And he said, well, everything you've said very much points to a kind of ADHD frame of mind. And I cannot explain to you the incredible overpowering sense of oh I get it now you know 52 years old when he said that to me and so much of the chaos so much of the kind of melancholy things like suicide ideation all of those things suddenly there was an incredible overwhelming sense to it all and I suddenly realized that because I used to walk off stage almost every night and go oh I didn't do the show I meant to do I was sitting on the train I came up with this show is going hello Oxfam books and music extra here's a very clever thing about books oh isn't he good about Virginia Woolf isn't he clever what a clever man and then instead they turn up and they went what the hell was that they, it was sad one minute and then he did some jokes and we were all over the shop right and then I suddenly realized why the audience that do come back time after time they haven't been coming back 
back time and time again. We're going to come back until he does a linear narrative <laughs> and then we're going to stop. They've been coming precisely because they knew as much of what I was going to say as I knew what I was going to say, right? What, and partly it comes from reading. What I love about filling my mind with stories and it, it explain my reading as well. Why do I read five books at the same time? Why can I never really finish things? Why do I, I can finish what I meant to finish, but it's all over the shop. And it, all of that made sense. And I was thinking about the fact that what I love about books and stories and the people that I meet is that everything that I hear from them and everything that I read from those, all of them create layer upon layer upon layer. If you open yourself up to as many stories as possible, you will find that the world becomes an incredibly rich place. What's that? Incised slabs oh, of Europe. Isn't that wonderful there? Let's see that. This is, so this is incised slabs of Europe. Uh, let's see which incised. You couldn't read this one in the bath. Yeah, and it's just, there we go. There's wow. uh, with a rather, rather frightening monkish face. I don't know if you can know the kind of way that that's been done. That is, uh, I mean, I think what we're really going to find out is the problem is not people's minds. The problem is a society where the social rules are seen as so strict and people are so fearful of breaking those social rules that it creates an unbearable amount of anxiety. So people are keeping these things in. So for me, it would be, uh, one of the things was uh, suicide ideation, so a, a very negative, so all these thoughts go on all the time and some of those thoughts will be thoughts that will just go, they hate that, they hate me, oh my god, that person's just looking at me, and they, they hate me, they think I'm an idiot, and that person thinks to me, oh my god, did I just say the wrong thing, I think I said the wrong thing, I think that, oh my god, I think, did that sound like it was meant to be a sexual joke? Or yeah, so that's going on, or there's this incredible, and then from the speed of those thoughts, for me personally, will lead to kind of, uh, you know, sometimes a reasonably deep kind of melancholy and as I said, sometimes long periods of time where not that I would go and, you know, attempt suicide, but the constant thoughts maybe for two months that in any, any time where there was, the, I wasn't distracting myself with something else. But a lot of it is, it's, it's seeing stimulation everywhere. You know, it's kind of, and once you get some, I have one friend uh, who, uh, she did a wonderful show called Cake in the Rain and uh, she's much younger than me and I met her when I was out in Perth. And um, she did a great show where she talked about suicide ideation. She said, every 25 minutes to 30 minutes, I think, why don't, why don't I kill myself? And she said, actually, I now see it as a very positive thing. Because every time I think that, I go, why don't I kill myself? Oh, hang on a minute. There's that blog post that I'm doing about trees in the parks. There's that new cafe that's got those amazing cakes. And then there'll be someone else. And when I saw her, and she's had a couple of diagnoses of various things, I said, does that still come? She went, no, it almost disappeared. Even before I started taking medication, this reframing of my mind. And it's a really bizarre thing because it's not, you know, it, it's such a, it's just some words in one way and you've lived with your mind all the time. But, so it's, a, it's, it's an odd thing that it required this stranger telling me these things. You know, and, and now I try as much as possible to, to not kind of mask any of these things at all. And also it means that I don't have, I really have far less periods of, and it hasn't affected my creativity or anything like that. I, I talk as fast, I write as fast, I get all those things done. And in fact, if anything, it stopped the critical voice that can, for many people, I think, be quite an unbearable voice and a voice where they, they, don't, they just hear it all the time. And, and so that, that's what, you know, the, and that's why I hate, when you get someone like Piers Morgan, well, I hate that just without <laughs> saying any more. But, um, you know, you get a lot of these people who are extremely rich and can control their environment and then they'll mock people who want a safe space or something. And you go, what you don't realise, and someone like me as well, predominantly, most places that I go are quite safe spaces because I'm a white guy wondering, you know what I mean? And he's a rich man and so he can mock those people because everywhere he goes is a safe space. And in the way that they, oh God, well they, they, uh, they didn't have PTSD in uh, the Second World War, they just got on with it. No, they did. No, you know, read a biography, an autobiography of anyone whose parents went and you will read, you know, Patrick Stewart, who's a wonderful person. Patrick Stewart funds the, uh, the abuse module that's at Huddersfield University because his father came back from the war and was so severely damaged. The thing was, it all happened, but no one talked about it. It's like, keep calm and carry on. That's not true at all, is it? Pretend to keep calm and carry on until you can't carry on anymore. That's, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons that I don't do dictionaries. Because as I said, please define ADHD. They go, bloody hell, this is worse than Tristram Shandy. Um, so, Yeah, our oldest book here 
dates back to the 15th century. It's an incunable, which I think is, that means a, a book which predates the printing press. You know that excitement when you found, one of my favourite things about going to libraries and going to bookshops is when there's a regular who comes in who has something recommended for them every time. And sometimes you'll see the librarians and, you know, so, so Gloria will walk in. I don't know why I've chosen Gloria, but I have. Gloria will walk in and uh, they'll go, right, she's coming. I know she's going to want a recommendation. Do we all agree? This is not normally her kind of book. It's not normally her kind of book. You're right. But I think it's such a great book. You really loved it as well. I loved it as well. And I loved it as well. Right. I think we should recommend it. And she comes over and she goes, right, so what have you got for me this week? You're, now, this is not normally the kind of book we'd recommend. OK, it's by Aya Barman Adebayo, and it's called Stay With Me. Oh, OK, just have a little look. Yeah, I wouldn't normally read something like this. No, we know, but we loved it. I loved it, I loved it, we all loved it. Will you give it a go? OK. <laughs> and off she goes, and now there's jeopardy. Jeopardy for two weeks. <laughs> and then Gloria comes back in, and initially when she walks through, she's got a face like thunder. I think, oh my God, we recommended the wrong thing. And she comes to the counter, and she puts the book down, she goes, well, this book you were banging on about, the first 20 pages, I could barely get through them. But then page 23, everything changes. I couldn't get out of the story. I read it in one fell swoop. It was wonderful. And everyone goes, hurrah, Kalu Kale, our lucky day. Gloria loved the book too, right? And that bit of sharing. Now, this is one that I know that Helen Chersky will be particularly interested in is Canoes of Oceana. <laughs> oh, this is, oh, this is so, you have to be so careful, don't you? You almost feel, have they expanded while they've been in there? You know, this yeah. is, ah. Oh. Here we are. So for Helen Chersky, here's a few canoes to enjoy. Uh, Solomon Island canoes there. Uh, marginal communities in northeastern Melanesia. Some more canoes there. So when was this then? This was 1937. Where's published in Honolulu. Published by the museum. That's all, there we go. So there. Canoes of Melanesia, Queensland and New Guinea. I'm not going to get volume one out because it's got a slight... Oh yeah, it's very fragile that yeah, one, isn't it? Yeah. The more stories you have, the more things you see in every space. So the more you read, the more you can... It's like I was in Wolverhampton recently and uh, I was talking about the pop art collection there. In fact, I think you've got Nell Dunn's Talking to Women, which I might pull out. Uh, here we go. Uh, there is... Um, there is an, an interview in this book with someone called Pauline Bunty. Do any of you are aware of you, you, James, I'll tell you what, I'll take it as red, but you're, you are red. It's, uh, if we see another hand, then we start. Pauline Bunty was an amazing artist. She was a pop artist, and uh, like so many female artists, she was kind of forgotten for a long time. She appears briefly in Ken Russell's Pop Goes the Weasel, a uh, short documentary about pop artists. Um, her work is staggering and beautiful, and Wolverhampton was one of the places which, well, in fact, it was the first art gallery in the UK that said, pop art is a really amazing thing, and I think we should build up a collection. So it's got incredible work, and a lot of Pauline Boaty. And it was actually going to that art gallery years ago that I first found out about Pauline Boaty. But in this book, Now I'm Talking to Women, which includes people like Edna O'Brien as well, there is the first interview with Pauline Boaty. And it is a still a really relevant uh, interview. She talks, for instance, about her partner and the fact that the reason that they got together was he was the first person she'd met who actually could just talk to a woman as if they were a human. And, you know, something, as we know, Jordan Peterson is unable to do. But any of you have seen that ridiculous clip of if you're not a regular kind of sexuality, then I don't know what you are. If you're a woman, then I can talk to you in a stereotype way, because I don't know who... The, well, why not just talk to them as human beings, Jordan? Really? The top public intellectual? We need more libraries. So, um... Oh, this is Lady Lockyer again. Oh, right, OK. Again, that, that must what be... Did, what was that, 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 the laws, of the, the, what's that, what was that actually The laws, reader? resolutions of women's rights. So that, that links with her um, uh, suffragist yeah, beliefs. Yes. Various are the, are the conceits and judgments of men. Nature teaches each to prefer his own. Hence it is that the number of books multiply insomuch that according to the wife man, thereof is no end. To expect new matter, to give old proverb the lie, Nihil jam dictum. It's enough. So this must be, yeah, preface to the reader. The Cupid photos are very funny because, <laughs> or photos, sorry, the Cupid um, drawings are, are very fun because they are, they're all kind of poses that people used to have on Pirelli calendars. You know <laughs> what I mean? They're, they're kind of, 
There's another bit of Lady Lock here. The, the, oh, that, Lady that's, Lock. That's yeah. a bit on jujitsu. I like the fact that oh, she. Oh, there's the jujitsu of Lady Lock. She, yeah. she particularly recommends figures 44 and 45. She knows jujitsu. She studied it. First position it. of the year. So uh, perhaps the most difficult throws are those given in figures 44 and 45, which are here reproduced called the Ukamata, for it requires immense practice to get the balance necessary to gain the second position. What a wonderful thing, again, this real polymath autodidact kind of, you yeah. know. First position. There we go. So those are from from there. Take yeah. it away, everyone. But is that's, watching. I mean, that became a, a sort of um, in. I think the press picked up or, or coined the term suffragitsu, which which was sort of slightly condescending, but it was used by certainly the, the suffragettes, um, sort of advanced guard, their protective guard. They adapted this this new this new form of, of self defence that had just come in from Japan. Wow. Um, as a sort of official form of self defence, because it uses the strength of strength of your attacker against them. Um, yeah, which I guess is why it, you might think, why is that in nature? But in a way, it's a study of, of human human um, energy and human um, motion, isn't it? Of the human body, you study you study the human body of, of your on the surface stronger opponent in order to use their their movements to to get them down on the floor. I'm really thinking of suffragitsu must have been used at some point in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah. You know, if, if Alan never used that, I'll be, uh, <laughs> I'll be absolutely amazed. As we build up the stories of a place, then the air kind of becomes thicker. And Alan's, Alan wrote this book, Jerusalem, right? It's longer than the Old Testament. <laughs> And the reason it's so long, someone said, Alan, why have you written a book so long? He said, so only the strongest can critique me, which I think is wonderful, right? To give you an idea of it, right, also, his book of short stories, one of the short stories is 236 pages long. That gives you an idea of how his mind works, right? But whenever I read one of his stories, when I read Jerusalem, I, and I had to read it quite quickly, huge book where we were doing a couple of events together, and the moment I returned to Northampton, there were ghosts everywhere. There was the Black Lion pub, which is part of the story. There is the church, which Alan himself was actually christened in. There is the story of Oliver Cromwell that he writes about. There is the story of Charlie Chaplin playing the music halls. There are the stories, sometimes of the Paleolithic men and women that he's written about. And all of those places are now, you know, this is that thing which I love, which is every single town, city, village or hillside becomes like a geological section. You know when you see that, all the different sediments. And these are the sediments of the stories. So yesterday what uh, Jez did was Jez put together a load of stuff from downstairs here in the archive uh, and the storerooms of Exeter Library to for me to kind of talk about while I was doing my talk in the Central Library and some of it also in the St Thomas Library. And I just I would show you some I mean this is such a, a beautiful thing this is uh, Pender's Fen um, by David Rudkin and you've obviously seen it many times, I imagine, yes, haven't you? Yeah. Um, but that's, that's great because of the descriptions in between. So there's quite fulsome descriptions of some of the ideas he's trying to get across. So it, it, it's well worth reading as a supplement to, to seeing it. And it's extraordinary. extraordinary. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how the play was lost for so long. And... Uh, and now it is so revered. Yeah. Nothing is pure, my race is mixed, my sex is mixed. I am woman and man and light with darkness mixed, mixed. I am nothing special, nothing pure, I am mud and flame. And then we've got this which I talked about, which is just a lovely book. This is the, 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 the story of, um, of Oliver Postgate's life, his autobiography. Um, I won't say any more because what you can do is cut away there to me actually talking on stage. That'll be a handy edit, won't it? Right, was, which ones am I going to... There's so much here. It's Jez, you've done such a fantastic... I mean, Oliver Postgate, I'll tell you what, I mentioned him again. It's Oliver Postgate. I saw a wonderful uh, musical based around Bagpuss. And I was lucky to be brought up in that generation of Noggin the Knob and Bagpuss and Ivy the Engine. And both Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman, I think... And one of the things that always used to annoy me very early stages on stand-up circuit was when people do routines go, oh, I to CB, were they on drugs or what? And they weren't on drugs, they were using human imagination. It's a really fantastic thing. If you know, and that's where you get stories like Bagpuss, where you know, I love the fact that in something like Bagpuss, you know, I, I, as, an, as a five-year-old, of course, I didn't know that Professor Yaffle was meant to be Bertrand Russell, you know. And now, every time I'm trying to read Bertrand Russell, nah, 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 nah. oh, Bagpuss, you know nothing whatsoever about the nature of perception. You know, and, it's, uh, <laughs> and of course, then it comes quite close to Richard Dawkins. Oh, Bagpuss, don't be so sick, there's no such thing. And, um, 
but there's a real beauty to Oliver Postgate's work as well, because the humanity, that's the thing. I, I need that. I need that in writers, I need that in performers, I need that in musicians. You know, when you watch someone, like there's a Patti Smith book, I think, here. And then you have this, which is, again, great thing to find in uh, um, there, that class oh, war... Oh. There we go, Maggie Thatcher, the best cut of all, with a meat <laughs> cleaver. And the, <laughs> it's just very grainy graphics, isn't it? It's, it's real sort of um, sort of photocopied. Well, you get graphics. that idea, don't you, that everyone's just sat in the basement of a cafe. Yeah. It, it's like I remember that with the Riot Girls when there used to be a cafe called Bungie's in London, which was like a folk cellar and various other things. Lovely little vegetarian place, and uh, you would always see in one corner bands like Huggy Bear cutting out and pasting and making their next yeah. fanzine. There we go. Now, I think that's uh, Prince Harry. He's the oldest one, isn't he, Prince Harry? Yeah, mm. there we go. I think that's the birth of Prince Harry. Another fucking royal parasite. It's uncompromising. There we go. Class war, a decade of disorder. Right, uh, we've come down uh, a slightly windy street to this fantastic shop, which is Book Cycle, uh, in, in a beautiful, slightly crooked building. And it's a bookshop where you can give whatever you want for the books, but you're only allowed to take three a day. So it is always very, very difficult. It's a wonderful charity. Find out more about Book Cycle. But I'm going to go in and I'm going to see which three I'm going to take away. Last time I was here, I found Beyond the Outsider by Colin Wilson, which was signed by Colin Wilson to Richard. And I found out a bit more of the story of that. But uh, we're going to go in and, uh, yeah, it's just a wonderful place. And then down... See, this is, this is, I think, the first one which is looking like it might be in the three because I've just complete fairy tales of Brothers Grimm. And I think of reading a lot of Angela Carter and uh, Marina Warner, and uh, perhaps I need to, to read uh, those so that I can uh, understand the, uh, the brilliance of Marina Warner and uh, Angela Carter a little bit more. Uh, there's a Jean Reese there, of course. Always love Jean Reese. Uh, there we are, Wide Sagasso Sea, her most famous novel. Obviously, I don't need another copy of that because I've got about five. Uh, in the same way, I don't need another copy of Muriel Spark's uh, Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. But Muriel Spark, not only a brilliant writer, but short as well, which is one of my favourite things. Uh, short novels, there's not enough of them. Um, lots of H.G. Wells, which is interesting. Because, we, again, we talked about H.G. Wells when we were in the, uh, in the library, downstairs in the library. Um, let's have a look. Oh, there we go. This is Journey Through a Small Planet. That's uh, an interesting, and again, now I can't remember if I've, already, if I've already bought that or not. Let's have a look upstairs, because this is where I found the Colin Wilson last time when I was upstairs. So um, I think I need to know more about Hildegard of Bingen, actually. So that may well be one of the three that I, uh, I take away today. Arthur Vagels, Sappho of Lesbos, and uh, I've just been reading a wonderful book um, called Short History of Queer Women, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, uh, the, the, the author, she's so funny and aphoristic, and I just, I, I would be fascinated to see what uh, Arthur, who was uh, late Inspector General of Antiquities, the Egyptian government, what he has made of, uh, of Sappho of Lesbos. So it, it might have a very different take to some of the, uh, uh, the, the more recent takes. <laughs> which uh, have not covered up quite so much or made so many alibis and excuses. Right, so we've divided up because you're allowed three books each and there's three of us on this crew. So uh, I've taken four and uh, Alice and Trent have just taken one each. So uh, there we go. That was uh, the choice of Alice, Book of Photography. Excellent choice by uh, Trent there of uh, Helen Sharman and Christopher Priest. I wonder if that's Christopher Priest, the science fiction author. That would be interesting. Uh, I did get The Complete Grimm's Fairy Tales. Uh, I did get a, uh, a biography of Hildegard of Bingen. And uh, then I got Sappho of Lesbos. And, uh, and a book about Carson McCullers. So that's what we did today. I'm holding a book that I've been wanting to hold in my hand for 15 to 20 years. Uh, it is not my copy. I will not leave because I'm in the, uh, the archive, uh, the basement of uh, Exeter Central Library. But it is this. It is Practically True by Ernest Thesiger, which is Ernest Thesiger from Old Dark House and Bride of Frankenstein and, of course, a keen embroiderer. Some of you will know of his work, Adventures in Embroidery, which I do have. But this is his impossible to find, apart from for Mark Gatiss, autobiography. 
practically true. Uh, I've opened it on this. Othello was not one of Tree's best parts, and I don't think he ever took it very seriously. He used to stride about the stage making strange, jealous noises, which sounded like the mooing of a cow in calf. One night, he and I were having an animated conversation in the wings when I suddenly realised that he'd missed his entrance. Sir Herbert, I cried, your cue has gone. Ooh, mood Tree, just to keep the action of the play going. And then in a whisper, come to supper in the dome tomorrow. Ooh, we must thresh this question out. Ooh, I want to know what you think about, ooh, my new leading lady. So there we are, practically true, Ernest Thesiger, undoubtedly the book of the day for World Book Day. Thanks, Jez. It's all right. really hope you enjoyed that and we've got loads of other new ideas coming up we've got quite a few things that we've made already and we've got plans to make a lot more things and if you can help it would be great if you could go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles to help fund all of our big ideas and some of our quite small ideas and if you can't afford to that's absolutely fine as well obviously we want to make these things as free as possible for as many people as possible but if you can subscribe there'll probably be a subscribe thing there or there or there or there uh, that will be fantastic as well